Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot for the invitation. Thanks to everybody for uh, being here uh, in your couch, uh, I, I hope. Uh, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm uh, I guess I'm, I'm neither a real computer scientist nor a real mathematician. So uh, uh, <laughs> I'll try to speak to everyone. Uh, and I've been doing for, for many years, I was, uh, I've been interested in health uh, uh, for many years and uh, I've been uh, interested in, uh, in brain imaging for many years, but recently I've been looking at other kinds of data and these other kinds of data have led to new kinds of problems, uh, challenges and uh, new collaborations. So I'll be talking about uh, some work that came out, which is about um, supervised learning with missing values. And this is work that was done uh, with uh, Julie Joss uh, Erwan Scornet, uh, Marine Morvan, uh, Nicolas Prost, and uh, Thomas Moreau. So the, the problem of missing values is that in, in some uh, uh, data analysis settings, uh, uh, we have only uh, partially observed examplars. So uh, a very uh, typical uh, situation is if you do social sciences and you, um, uh, you um, uh, use questionnaires to acquire data, uh, so you um, Ask. Uh, you have people fill in the questions, and well, some people will not fill in fully the questionnaire. Uh, okay, that's not a question for me. Um, so, so that's the first. Uh, that's the first example. Another example is if you're doing a, a data integration, you're integrating data from uh, different databases or different tables. You might have uh, missing correspondences across tables. Uh, you might have one uh, somebody who is in one table but not in another. You might have an entity such as a, a company, for instance, in one table but not another. And if you do the, the join to create the, your, the table that you need for the analysis, then you'll have some missing values there. And finally, you might have per, uh, measurements that are not performed. Uh, for instance, due to uh, the urgency of a given patient, you might not measure a patient's weight if that patient is bleeding a lot. Uh, so. The problem of missing values is really ubiquitous in health and social sciences. Conversely, uh, it's not very present in other kinds of data. For instance, when I was doing um, uh, medical imaging, we, it was much less of a problem. Now, uh, one thing that I'd like to, to stress about the examples that I gave before is that the missingness is noise, but it's also a signal. If somebody um, is given a questionnaire and chooses not to answer uh, some questions, there might be some information in there. Uh, maybe that person doesn't know or doesn't want to answer. Uh, if some measurements are not performed because the patients were too badly ill, just the fact that those measurements are not performed tells us that the patient was badly ill. Inversely, the fact that some measurements were performed tells us some suspicion about what the, the doctors thought. So uh, this is a bit the, the setting and the, the questions that I'm interested in are given those settings, how do we build good predictive models on such data? <clears throat> and so the, the outline of my talk is I'll really go and, and I'll explain the, the, the classical uh, settings both for supervised learning theory and I suspect uh, everyone here is familiar but also for the classical Missing values framework, which uh, has a long running history in statistics. Uh, uh, then I'll discuss a bit how we can adapt existing learning procedures by basically adapting tools from, from classical uh, missing value framework. Uh, but, but I'll show that there are a few uh, new results here. Uh, then I'll look at the seemingly simple problem of the linear uh, data generating mechanism. And I'll show that the optimal predictor is uh, not linear. Uh, and finally, I'll uh, take a differentiable programming uh, point of view on this uh, and introduce what will basically be a, a neural network architecture that's motivated uh, by the previous work and by a specific uh, a theory that draws from, uh, uh, from the classical missing value framework. And if you have any questions, I have the, the chat that is open on my second screen and I'm, I'm monitoring it. So please do not hesitate. Uh, so the, the, let me uh, first discuss the settings uh, starting by the, the supervised learning theory uh, and, then, and then discussing the uh, classical missing value framework. This is based on uh, a long paper that, that we wrote uh, 
uh, that really, uh, where we really made the effort of um, uh, stating uh, in a consistent uh, frame framework the uh, prior uh, art, uh, well, the main prior arts in the in the two uh, bodies of literature, both the supervised learning and the the missing value frame. <clears throat> so let's start with supervised learning theory, fairly classic settings. Uh, I'm given pairs. X, Y, they're uh, here, uh, I, I'll choose them as uh, uh, drawn IID from two spaces, uh, uh, X and Y. And my goal is to find a function uh, that goes from X to Y such that F of X is close to Y for some, uh, some distance. And, and typically uh, I'll consider uh, a loss uh, that captures this notion of closeness that, that gives me uh, some measure of error on the space Y. Uh, and then I, I'll be interested in questions such as, uh, can I get close to uh, what I will call the base predictor, which is uh, the function that uh, gives me the minimal expected loss. So really what I'm interested in here is in this expected loss and in finding a function that gives me a small expected loss. And as a small comment, if I use uh, uh, certain losses uh, I, uh, on certain problems, I will estimate different uh, statistical quantities. And uh, for instance, if I use the quadratic loss, then my base predictor is the conditional expectation of uh, uh, y given x. Uh, so there's also, uh, and that, that last uh, uh, statement to me is quite important because uh, uh, there are many places where people uh, are not interested in, uh, in prediction in, 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 in engineering sense, uh, but they're definitely interested in conditional expectancies. So what, what we have here is a tool set that uh, uh, enables us to estimate conditional expectancies. And so then I, uh, you know, um, there's a, a body of literature on different procedures to estimate a, a, a function uh, given training data. So I'll call a learning procedure uh, uh, something that gives me uh, uh, an estimated function from a train data set. So a train data set is a, 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 a finite uh, uh, ensemble of pairs uh, X and Y. Uh, and uh, I'll say that um, a procedure is base, consistency, is base consistent if asymptotically it gives me, it, it converges to the uh, base predictor. So this is, this is the notion of, of uh, consistency uh, which is quite common in statistics, but uh, uh, focused on the risk. It's, it's important to, to say that, the, uh, uh, to keep in mind that uh, this notion uh, tells me nothing about uh, any form of uh, uh, parameters of the, of the function. And uh, I, I really do not care. Uh, that function may not be unique, uh, it's not important to me. My, my goal is really to minimize the, the expected uh, uh, loss. And so a, a very common procedure to, to tackle these problems is to uh, minimize the empirical risk uh, instead of the expected risk. And I, I might uh, uh, um, add some, some regularization. I might, uh, I might choose a specific uh, um, a function uh, class uh, in, in which I do my minimization and uh, the, the function class, the procedure that I use to, to minimize this, uh, uh, this risk, uh, all this is basically the science and the art of, uh, of supervised learning, which I, I'm, sure, I'm sure you know. So this is our setting for supervised learning. And once again, I'm stressing that I'm really interested in controlling the expected uh, loss and not really anything else. And now let's uh, have a look at the classical results uh, for the uh, missing value um, uh, literature. And uh, here, I let me be a bit uh, precise with my notations because the, so the challenge with missing values is that uh, your observations basically do not uh, uh, live naturally in a, in a vector space because you're gonna have missing entries. Uh, so in the, in the classical framework, uh, you're, you're, you have full data, X, that lives in a vector space, and you're given uh, a, a missingness indicator, which is a, a binary uh, mask of the same dimension as the full data, which tells you whether you've observed a feature or not. And then what you're really observing 
is the uh, incomplete data, which is um, which lives in a, in a space that's uh, the a, a tensor product of the uh, a union of um, the my, my original vector space and a symbol that I'll call NA, which tells me that I didn't observe the data. And so to give you an example, uh, an example realization, uh, here uh, my underlining data is given by, by this vector. Can you, I guess you can all see my, um, uh, my cursor. Uh, so the, the, the example realization uh, is given by, uh, by, by this vector. Uh, my mouse tells me that I'm observing only a fraction of uh, uh, the uh, entries. And so what I'm really given to my learning, thank you for the, for the confirmation for the cursor. What I'm really uh, um, uh, seeing, uh, what I'm really giving to my, my learning procedure is the following uh, data, which is incomplete data. And I, I can also uh, introduce the, the, the notation uh, XO and XM for observed and missing, and uh, XO and XM together form the full data, but uh, uh, each of them uh, contains only the observed data or the missing data, okay? And uh, really the, the, the challenge, uh, and I'll come back to this, but the challenge is that uh, I'm working in this, in this space, which is a bit of an awkward space. And now the uh, classical, really a very important classical result of the uh, missing values literature, uh, which was established by Rubin, Donald Rubin in 76, uh, is in the setting of parametric likelihoods. And here, the, 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 the setting is the following. I'm given, uh, there, uh, well, I, I assume there is a, a, a data generating um, mechanism with a given distribution, f of theta, for the complete data, x. And there is also another uh, generating, another random process with another uh, distribution that generates a mask m. And now the goal in statistical inference is to estimate theta of the complete uh, of the, of the uh, complete uh, data generating process. And if I do this, I can write the, the full uh, likelihood. And in the full likelihood, I need to compute the expectation, given that I'm, I'm, I'm given only the observed data, not the missing data. I need to compute the expectation over uh, the missing value mechanism. So I need to compute this expectation. And for this, I need the details of the uh, data generating mechanism. Now, this, this is annoying because it's a data generating mechanism that I'm not interested in. So uh, we can do something else that seems uh, uh, more, maybe not natural, but easier, which is to completely forget it, to ignore it, and to say, well, I'm just going to marginalize over the non-observed entry uh, 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 using the, the data uh, generating uh, uh, distribution for the complete data. And now there is a, a very important uh, result by Donald, Donald Rubin, which tells us that in certain setting, I, it's, it's legit to do this. I can actually ignore the missing value um, mechanism. And for this, uh, I need to be in a situation that's known as missing at random. And this is an, an, ad hoc, uh, an ad hoc assumption that tells us that for non-observed value, the probability of missingness does not depend on the non-observed value, okay? Which tells us that if I have two vectors with the same uh, uh, observed value, uh, and, and I don't, I'm not specifying anything for the non-observed value, then uh, their um, um, uh, um, missingness uh, mechanism gives me the same data distribution. Well, the same distribution in the missingness. And in those settings, which are known as missing at random or MAR, then uh, maximizing the likelihood that ignores the missingness mechanism gives the same maximum likelihood estimates for the uh, uh, parameters of model A, which is the model of the, the full data, as the full likelihood. So basically, I can maximize the likelihood of the uh, data generating process that I'm interested in forgetting the data generating process that I'm not interested in, which is the missing value data generating process. And now this, uh, uh, there are variants. Now this first uh, assumption 
is a, a, a bit complicated and there is a special case which is much easier to understand which is missing completely at random which tells me that basically m is independent of x and uh, now i'll claim that uh, those two assumptions above are actually not very realistic very often my missingness is related to the value that it's quote unquote hiding if i'm asking you how much money you make uh, if you're in the middle of the distribution, you're more likely to answer that if you're on the upper or lower end. Uh, and so this gives us to the, uh, uh, this gives the situation that is the missing not at random situation, in which case it's not ignorable. And the, then the inference is harder because we must explicitly model the mechanism. Now the, the missing, uh, uh, so but, but here, here are, are intuitions, this is the complete a data generating model, uh, well, the data generating process. I've um, uh, shown in white partially observed uh, values, and I'm showing you in missing completely at random. So I'm basically dropping randomly some values. And here I'm showing a censoring process, which is an extremely brutal process. Basically, I'm, I'm dropping values that are above a threshold. Now we can clearly see that the, the censoring process is actually biasing. The, the, the distribution, whereas the missing completely at random is not. So this is going to be a much harder statistical uh, inference setting than this one. The uh, missing at random uh, uh, assumption and the, the notion of ignorability has uh, been used to derive many uh, estimation procedures for missing value setting. Uh, the most famous one being expectation maximization algorithm, which was, I believe, uh, uh, historically introduced for missing values. And really the idea is that we're going to optimize uh, the likelihood that ignores the missing value mechanism by alternating an expectation in the likelihood over the non-observed value. And then the maximization of the resulting expression uh, uh, and alternating the two. Another approach, uh, uh, which is maybe a, a simpler uh, often uh, in, in practice, uh, because uh, the problem with, well, uh, the challenge with the expectation maximization is it requires coding a new routine uh, each time you're given a new, a new likelihood problem, not the end of the world. Uh, and uh, so there's another approach, which is to use imputation, which is a routine that will compute the probability of the missing values given the observed. And then uh, from using this probability, we'll create a com uh, complete data, for instance, by imputing by the conditional expectation. Uh, and this uh, enables us basically to emulate the expectation in the, in the likelihood that um, um, ignores the missing mechanism. And then on this complete data, we can apply a standard routine from our favorite uh, package to maximize the likelihood of complete data. And we can do slightly better by using multiple imputation in step two, which is basically sampling in the, in the uh, conditional probability uh, sampling missing uh, imputed uh, uh, plausible imputations in the conditional ex uh, uh, probability rather than taking uh, only one value such as an expectancy. Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, in prediction settings, uh, those two uh, procedures must be adapted to be able to work on out of sample uh, data. Uh, because the, the, the naive way of writing imputation or writing expectation maximization does not know how to separate uh, a fitting procedure from a, a testing procedure, from a, an inference procedure. Uh, and, and we're immediately hitting a, one problem, which is that the predictive model is applied only on uh, a partially observed test data. So if you, if you give me test data, it's going to have holes in it. And I need to have a predictive a model that works uh, on this data with holes in it. And so these, these are the, the settings we're interested in. And so our settings really is actually a, a merge uh, between the, uh, the two things that I've presented. Uh, here we focus on risks and not likelihood. Uh, so I'd like to say that uh, the, the core results of um, uh, the MAR assumption, the historical one does not immediately apply. And uh, some of the dogmas uh, may not carry over. 
Uh, we do have missing values at test time, so we need a function that must predict on missing values. And we have a challenge, which is that if we, if we just want to uh, take our textbook uh, statistical learning theory uh, 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 recipes or procedures and apply them, uh, we, we're going to minimize, for instance, the empirical risk. And the challenge is that uh, the, the function that we need to create is a function in a semi-discrete space. Uh, and sorry for the, the typos and invitation, this doesn't really make sense. Um, uh, and so this semi-discrete space is going to pose problems simply because it's, it's harder to optimize on this semi-discrete space. And we're gonna easily fall in uh, combinatorial optimization problems. That's one of the set of problems that, uh, that we, we fall into. Okay, so now I'm gonna uh, give a set of results that uh, we uh, introduced in the last few years, which uh, basically bridge the gap. Uh, and I'll start by um, a few results on, on how do we adapt classical learning procedures uh, to uh, work with missing values. <clears throat> and the first thing that we can do is that we can uh, use imputation uh, uh, and we can impute the test. So suppose that we're given uh, F star, which is the base predictor on fully observed data. I'm not telling you how we got it. Maybe we had enough uh, uh, data in the training set that was fully observed, uh, but we're just given this base predictor on the fully observed data. Then what I'm telling you in this expression here is that I can build um, uh, using uh, expectation on uh, the conditional distribution of the missing given the observed. I can build a base optimal predictor that works on uh, partially observed data. And for this, I need to compute the expectation on the uh, missing given the observed. And this can be done uh, uh, using multiple imputation by sampling. So really, at test time, I can sample uh, multiple imputations and I can basically average uh, the predictions. If, by chance, I have um, the base predictor on the fully observed uh, data, which is uh, a big if, but... Uh, and, and one comment is that in general, single imputation is not a consistent. I can't take a base predictor which, uh, uh, for fully observed data and convert it to a base predictor for partially observed data uh, um, with sing a single in is imputation. By the way, in nowhere here am I saying that I'm going to perform as well on the partially observed data as on the fully observed data. There will be a cost there will be a drop in performance. Uh, however, I'm telling you that I'm, I'm performing as well as I can. That's something important. Often people want to perform as well on the full data, on the, on the partially observed data as on the full data. In general, this is not possible. <clears throat> now, another procedure, uh, which is a bit brutal, uh, is to impute by a constant. So each time I have a missing value, uh, I'm going to repeat, uh, replace it uh, by uh, a constant alpha. Uh, and I can choose my constant uh, the way I wish. I can choose it, for instance, uh, as being the mean in the train set. And I'm going to do this over all my data, over my train set and my test set. And then I need to assume a, a few things, which are basically some, some regularity assumptions, uh, uh, first, uh, I'm uh, assuming that uh, my, my, uh, my regression, my link between uh, X and Y is uh, sufficiently regular. And those assumptions are here. And then uh, second, same ID, I'm assuming that my uh, missing mechanism is also uh, sufficiently regular. And here we have uh, uh, made the assumption that we have only one uh, variable on which there is missingness. And the important thing is that uh, the function that gives me the probability of missingness is continuous. Now, given those assumptions, uh, we can show that the uh, base predictor after constant imputation is equals to the base predictor on the original data almost everywhere. Okay, so those are 
almost everywhere the same function. As a consequence, I can have a procedure that does constant imputation here, followed by a, a learner that is consistent on my data, so a universally consistent learner. This will give me um, a predictor that is uh, um, consistent almost everywhere. And now the almost everywhere is a, is a technical detail, but the, the reason uh, is that I can have collision. And if in my data, I have a, a, a feature vector uh, that collides with my imputation, then uh, I, will, uh, I will not be consistent here. So if my uh, features are continuous and noisy, this, is, this won't happen. Uh, but if my features are disc discrete and I've chosen alpha as a value of, uh, that, that the feature takes, then this will happen. So this is immediately, by the way, an argument for choosing uh, a mean imputation instead of median imputation because median imputation will create those collisions. Okay, but this, this is quite interesting because it's telling us that imputing by constant, imputing by the mean, for instance, is not a stupid idea if I'm interested in prediction. And the reason is that my uh, uh, learning procedure will capture this and compensate for this. I'm, I'm creating something that is, uh, that is uh, an, um, abnormal in my, in my distribution, my X uh, 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 prime. But my learner is able to detect this and to compensate for this because it's, um, it's a, a universally consistent. And this is an interesting result because it's a strong opposition to uh, the classic missing value uh, practice, which tells you that imputing by constant is disastrous because it will strongly distort your distribution. And the, 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 the reason why we have this, uh, why we depart from uh, this good practice is because we're interested in uh, uh, different goals and because, so risk minimization, and because we use uh, uh, extremely non-parametric um, uh, models, which is basically our universally consistent learning. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we can adapt supervised learning procedures. This will lead us to different trade-offs than classical statistical inference. And this is something to me that's quite important and I'd like to stress. Uh, we have different goals, we have different tools, and, and hence we're not tied by the, the classical good practice. Good imputation is not necessary, as I've shown you. And in uh, our paper, we also um, looked at the risk of tree-based models, uh, such as random forests. Uh, and these are interesting, and they're used a lot with missing values because they can naturally optimize for input in semi-discrete spaces, uh, just like they can naturally optimize for categorical data uh, because they're they're basically performing a greedy uh, combinatorial optimization. And they're very used in practice for the kind of data uh, for which there is missing values. <clears throat> now I'd like to, to, to switch gear and uh, to consider a parametric setting, uh, which is basically uh, um, a setting in which I have uh, a linear data generating mechanism. And uh, I'll show you that this setting is actually quite rich uh, and has a few results that, that may be surprising. And so this is work that was done uh, by uh, Marine Le Morvan with uh, Nicolas Prost, Erwin Scornet, uh, and uh, Julie Joss and myself, and was published at AI Stats uh, last year. And so uh, the setting is we have a, a linear a generating mechanism, y is a linear function of x, the fully observed uh, uh, data, the sorry, the complete data. Uh, uh, however, uh, we're observing z, which is only partially observed. It's uh, uh, x masked by, m. sorry, I have a change of notation compared to the uh, um, uh, prior part because I copy pasted things too fast yesterday evening. And uh, the first thing that we see is the, the best predictor, the optimal predictor may not be linear. And for this, let me uh, um, introduce a very simple example. I have Y, which is the sum of X1 and X2 plus noise. And I have the link between X2 and X1. Uh, 
which is a nonlinear link. It's an exponential function. Uh, when I'm observing only x1, I can, uh, the optimal predictor is given by using this formula. And then I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, the optimal predictor is written as y, which is the sum of x1 and exponential of x1. So this nonlinearity is introduced because of the link between the two, the two uh, variables. And because when I'm removing one variable, the best thing that the model can do is use this link. So even with a linear uh, generating mechanism, we, don't, we may not have a uh, um, best predictor, which is a linear. So we need to uh, add extra assumptions. And basically, we'll make assumptions that our, uh, our covariates are Gaussian. And we're using a classical uh, assumption from the uh, missing value literature, which is that um, x conditionally on m is Gaussian. So if I give you a, a, a missing value pattern, uh, then there exists a, a mu and a sigma such that x is, uh, uh, follows a, a, a Gaussian distribution uh, with mu and sigma. And this a mu and sigma may be uh, dependent on m, or they may be <clears throat> independent from m. And if they're independent from m, then we're in this incomplete random setting. And now if, I, uh, if I'm in these settings, then uh, we can show that the optimal predictor is now a polynomial of x and cross product of m. And the problem is that this polynomial has two to the power d terms. So what I'm, the optimal predictor is really given by so a linear uh, a function of m and then uh, to which I will add uh, the combination of m and x, and then I need to add the two, the two term combination of m and uh, the x's, and each time I have different, uh, different uh, model coefficients. And we can immediately see the problem here, is that uh, we have two to the power d terms. So uh, this is a fairly complicated uh, expression. <clears throat> Uh, so this is a polynomial, and so I can uh, fit it uh, using linear, a linear model on a, an expanded basis. And if I, if I do this and I use an ordinary least square, uh, uh, then uh, unsurprisingly, I have a, a risk, a finite sample uh, risk uh, that's on the order 2 to the power d divided by n. So this tells me that I have a, a sample complexity with this procedure that uh, uh, scales with two to the power d. I need to, to guarantee a given estimation error. Uh, I need a number of samples that, uh, that is on the order of magnitude of two to the power d. And that's, that's related to the complexity of this expression. So this is uh, bad news. <clears throat> and now I can, I can uh, twist the problem and I can consider the problem as the following. My optimal predictor, my base predictor, is piecewise of phi. Uh, it's for a given combination of missing value features, it's, a, it's an affine function. Um, a function that is piecewise affine is a function that I can learn with a multilayer perception with uh, rectified linear units. Uh, so rectified linear units are, are uh, piecewise affine. Uh, and so what we can show is that we can apply a multilayer perception with a really nonlinearities uh, to the concatenated vector, which is x imputed by zeros uh, for the missing values and m below it. And for uh, this procedure to be consistent, unfortunately, if I have a single layer, which is the, the, the setting that we have studied, I need a width of uh, two to the power D. Now, the thing is, heuristically, we can reduce this width and hopefully capture uh, some uh, structure in the base predictor with the uh, multi-layer perception. So heuristically, we can uh, uh, control the model complexity uh, uh, by reducing the width of the uh, multilayer uh, perception. Uh, so 
given that we've run experiments and uh, so I'm, there's a lot of information in here so I'm going to go over quickly but uh, the um, our experiments show that in missing completely at random settings where imputation and EM should work well well imputation which is in red and EM which is in green work well uh, they uh, both at small sample in small sample settings and large sample settings they uh, give us um, a good prediction. Uh, constant imputation uh, with a linear model doesn't work well. It uh, doesn't work too bad, but it doesn't work well. It, it's not consistent, as you can see here. And what we're doing here uh, with uh, those lines is that we're varying the width of the, uh, the MLP, the multilayer perception, and as we're varying the, the width of the MLP, uh, we can see that we're exploring different trade-offs. And if we have a lot of data, we're better off having a very wide MLP. But if we don't have a lot of data, we're better off not having a very wide MLP. <clears throat> now, we can uh, do this with more complex data uh, missing value generating uh, mechanism. And if we do this, uh, we, we see that um, our procedure tends to be, becomes interesting compared to the other procedure. And uh, the, the reason is that it becomes extremely uh, uh, hard and, and non-consistent for the other procedures uh, to capture the more complex uh, uh, missing value mechanism. And in particular, if we're in a not ignorable setting, if we're in not ignorable setting, uh, imputation and EM cannot work. Uh, whereas our procedure uh, based on an MLP uh, works and, and converges. So the, the interesting thing is that we're using a very flexible model, the multilayer perception. We know it's uh, consistent if we have, if it's wide enough, but more importantly, because it's, it's very flexible, it's going to be robust to uh, violations of, uh, of the model. Okay, so to summarize this, uh, this part, uh, the uh, linear uh, prediction ev predictor even if we do constant imputation and even if we optimize the constant is not consistent. Uh, so if we, if we go back to our previous result that tells us that constant imputation works, yes, constant imputation works, but only if we have a very rich predictor. Even, so even in linear settings, in linear data generating settings, uh, uh, then a, a linear predictor with constant imputation will not uh, work as synthetically. I can uh, make this better by uh, doing a polynomial of the mask using the combinatorials of the mask, but this will incur a large uh, sample complexity. And I can, uh, uh, I'm better off replacing this with a multi-layer percep uh, perception, which is going to be consistent, uh, which if I have no assumption and no structure on my uh, missing value mechanism will require a lot of hidden units, but if I have more structure, will adapt. Okay, one last part. I guess you're all very tired, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna do only intuitions here, but one last part. Uh, given everything we've seen, now what we're going to do is that we're going to craft a dedicated architecture to approximate the base predictor. And this uh, paper uh, was uh, published at NeurIPS uh, last year uh, and is work that was led by Marine Le Morvan with uh, Erwan Scornel, Julie Joss, and uh, Thomas Moore. And the intuition is the following. If you just, just stick around for this intuition slide, if you're, if you're very tired, then the rest is, is going to be technical details. The intuition is the following. So suppose the simple setting where I have uh, my um, output y, which is a linear function of two inputs, uh, x1 and x2. And those two inputs are correlated. And uh, if I have um, uh, one of the two that is missing, then uh, the uh, best predictor will use the correlation between those two and hence needs to modify its uh, um, parameter, its, uh, its coefficient with regard to x1. If x2 is missing, I need a different value for x1, okay? 
But the, the point being that there is a link between uh, those values and this link is driven by the correlation of X1 and X2. And in general, if I have multivariate data, it's going to be driven by the covariance of this multivariate data. So each time that I have a different missing value pattern, I need to adapt my coefficients of my linear model, but I'm doing this modification to account for the covariance of my covariance. The challenge is that uh, there is uh, many of those missing data patterns uh, due to the uh, D possible missing data patterns. And if I need to learn independently all those coefficients, I'm falling back to the previous problem, which is uh, I have many coefficients to learn and it's hard. So we need to model the link between those, those coefficients. And for this, uh, we're going to assume that we're in a, a, a linear model and that the, the data is um, uh, generated with a Gaussian covariance. And in missing completely ra uh, at random settings, uh, uh, we can write the, um, the optimal predictor as uh, follows. So what you're seeing here, so here we have a fairly standard a linear model of the, um, uh, of the observed data. And here, what we can see is that we have an, another term which uh, uses the covariance of the observed data and the cross covariance of the missing data and the observed data uh, to um, capture basically this, uh, uh, this uh, link between the, between the um, uh, the, the, the covariance, okay? And so this term is the really the important uh, term here. It's really due to their, our Gaussian assumption on our data. And with uh, uh, this, uh, we, we see it appear in our optimal predictor. Now we can go even a bit further and we can look at other um, uh, missing value mechanism. And for instance, uh, a Gaussian self-masking where the data is, is my, Time over, okay. Uh, I have time over, okay. So then I'll just, I'll just skip over this. What I can tell you very quickly is that uh, what we do is that we take those expression, we approximate them using a differential approximation, which is basically enrolling uh, um, a series that approximates the, uh, uh, the inverse. And if we do this, we can come up with a dedicated architecture uh, that uh, approximates uh, well uh, the, um, the previous expressions. And the important thing is that this dedicated architecture works much better than MLPs, whether they're wide or deep, because it needs much less number of parameters to uh, approximate well. And in practice, it predicts well in uh, MAR settings or in missing and not at random setting. And it predicts uh, uh, better than expectation maximization or imputation uh, when their assumptions are violated in non-MAR settings or in high dimension, because in high dimension, uh, those procedures struggle. And I'll stop here and I'll take a few questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gail, for this ni nice talk. Uh, any questions? So maybe I could start uh, with one question. Um, could you talk about uh, a bit about um, applications and uh, this is application of um, imputation of missing data, for instance, in um, in medical uh, diagnosis or your your. Um, uh, I, I'm wondering, for instance, I know that there are some. Uh, modern data or, uh, often uh, are recorded on, uh, on graphs or uh, images, and uh, how, uh, how can you deal with that? Uh, it, it's a specific uh, interest of mine to no longer look at those structured signals, uh, so images, for instance, uh, because uh, those, so rather than an application, I'll tell you an anecdote. Uh, a year ago, I was in postdoc at, um, uh, in Montreal, and I came back here because of the COVID situation to work with uh, many different people at INRIA uh, with the hospitals. 
and the data that uh, that they have that is there in large amounts is not imaging data. Imaging data is expensive, and my, my friends, medical doctors, tell me that imaging data is too late. You make an image of someone when that person is not going well. The data that that that, that is data that is there in huge amounts is is very quote unquote stupid data uh, that has its own problem. And I could talk about this in, in length, uh, but there are more problems of databases. So there is missing value because the, 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 the questionnaire was not filled in correctly. There's missing value because the join was wrong. There's missing value because somebody used a different convention. Uh, and uh, I, here we really chose to focus on those settings. And now if you wanna do missing values in images, I guess there are two options. Either you have a few voxels or a few pixels that are missing in your image, in which case you should really be using the image literature and you should be using the, 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 the structure of the image, uh, local filters to do uh, what, what's rather known as uh, um, in painting, uh, or you have the full image that's missing. But if you have the full image that's missing, what you're going to give to your you know, bigger procedure is, is not the full image. It's going to be a descriptor that's extracted from the full image. In which case, we're back to the, to the settings that I've described here. Okay. Okay, that's clear. Uh, I think uh, Gilles and Blanchard has a question. Yeah, a question. Can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yes, uh, thank you a lot for the for the very interesting talk. So uh, I, I try to ask my question quickly. So basically, the, the message I get is from this summary slide and from your talk is that uh, if you have a non missing at random mechanism, basically exactly you have two to the power d sub models. So in principle, you would have to uh, theoretically to learn each of these separately corresponding to missing pattern, uh, potentially completely different from each other, but uh, somehow in practice, you hope that uh, if you have close uh, missing patterns, maybe there are communalities between these different models. So my question is, have you uh, compared to any approach based on something like a, uh, um, um, multitask, uh, multitask learning or transfer learning where here you have like each pattern is a task or is a, if you wish, and, and you have a na very natural way of uh, which is the Hamming distance between uh, missing patterns to, to have a closeness relationship between uh, these tasks? Uh, I, I think that's a, that's a very good question. I, I think, you know, implicitly what we're doing at the end does this, uh, not, not specifically the way, you, the way you said it, but implicitly it can be seen as a, as a multitask uh, a setting. Uh, I think you, you could definitely uh, use other uh, multitask learners. Uh, what we think is that there are many, but not all situations that are well approximate by the uh, setting uh, that, 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 we, uh, that we describe, which is, uh, you know, the simple assumptions. And in those settings, then we, we do hope that uh, our procedure will be optimal. Uh, we're currently improving quote-unquote details, which are not details on the procedure, which uh, make it much more robust uh, to finite sample and even to nonlinearities. And uh, with those improvements, we uh, hope to go in uh, a fairly intensive uh, benchmarking on real data uh, to test uh, when we're no longer in our toy uh, settings. But the, the, our assumption is that our toy settings are uh, good local approximations of real settings. I think my time is up. I'll answer. Uh, yes, I, I think we, 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 will, we will stop here. Uh, you have a question. You will see in the, in, in the, in the chat box. But I, I, I would suggest that you maybe you could answer in a, the chat box or maybe to, directly to, the, to Milad Leili. And uh, so I think we, we will stop now. And I want to thank you again, uh, Gail.